trying to get no blood. Can you guys hear me or do you hear noise in the background? Is this like a... How's my sound? Can you hear me? Let me get a thumbs up if you can hear me. Clearly? Concise? that now. Okay. I think we I think we solved that problem. Um it, I'm on life after link it's a it's a different live. That's tagged to the can you just text me please? I'm on live. See, Moody just joined in. <sighs> oh, wait, on the check in. Mr. Cox, I feel like a teacher again. I'm actually going to switch my location for just better lighting. Forgive me for this Teddy Riley moment we're having right now. This is actually like my second time going on live. And the first time, it wasn't my live. How's it going? I'm um, excellent. How are you doing today? I am well. I am well. I am getting a little adjusted to this live. Okay. How's the weather in Florida? I need something. All right. We're going to get started in about like 30 seconds. Okay. How's the sound hey. on your Excellent. Hi, Robin. All right. I don't know if you had the opportunity to see the uh, Teddy Riley versus Babyface. Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> and that was that was my concern going into this tonight, just making sure I don't have one of those moments. So no, so we good. To dive. I hope I'm. I'm hope I'm Babyface. <laughs> Uh, nobody wants to be Teddy in this moment. Right. All right. So, so you you just went horizontal on me. Just yep, yep, yep. I just want to make sure my light is right. Okay, we're good, man. I'm good. Great, great, great. So today I have the esteemed pleasure of interviewing, but now I, would, I wouldn't call it interview. I think having a conversation yeah. with a renowned alumni who goes by the name of Anthony Stephanie, class of 1990. So if we have anyone from class of 1990 in the room right now, if you could just drop like a nine zero, so we know we have some <laughs> representation inside, inside the room. Matter of fact, it would be nice for the, uh, our, our audience that's on right now, if you could just drop your representative class, that would be great. Yeah, so I know two let's see them all. In here. Let's, see, let's see who's in the room right now. Let's see who's represented for the young alumni. 
Hey, Dorothy. <laughs> Wait, where did I? I don't think we got a, a, a 2008 yet, man. Oh, there we go. Here we go. My friend Megan. Hey, Megan. All right. So to uh, oh wait, I don't know, I don't know what's happening. You guys are host, hosting events, and we're looking for some alumni right now. There we go. I think I see one coming in. So for the sake of time, Anthony, we're going to get started. Sure. So those, as I mentioned before, I have I have the pleasure of interviewing uh, Mr. Anthony Stephanie, um, class of 1990. So Anthony is what we consider a PJ master professional, which is one of the highest level of education that you could actually get in the um, golf world. And I actually had to look this up after we had a conversation yesterday, uh, Anthony, on why that was such a prestige title for you, because you are one of only two African-Americans since the inception in 1969. Yes. So you hold that title, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So I would love for you, especially as a young alumni, for people that may not be familiar with that title, once I finish the introduction, for you to elaborate a little bit more around that. Sure. Uh, in addition to that, Anthony has a corporate background uh, in strategic marketing and, and planning. And like most LU alumni, you know, service is um, part of our creed. So he has numerous years in advocacy work uh, with his most recent title in as an executive director uh, at a Kappa Alpha Psi Foundation. So, Anthony, without further ado, can you just give us a little bit more of your testimony? Absolutely, a day. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I'm just, first and foremost, I am certainly honored and, and I consider it a privilege to to be among, you know, not just Lincoln alum, but but young alum, as you referred. And I think it, it's it's incredibly important that we forge this relationship, this bond, um, and build on, you know, Lincoln's tradition of, of working together and serving, as you mentioned. Um, you know, my career to me is certainly not um, without recognition of Lincoln as my part of my fundamental uh, foundation, right? Um, you know, everything I think I've built on over the last, what, 30 years being out of Lincoln, um, wow, 30 years, um, you know, I think I, I established that at Lincoln because Lincoln was one of those special places that you can really go and you can kind of figure some things out, you know what I mean, and, and have some of your, your successes and missteps and what have you. But most importantly, I think forging those lifelong relationships um, with with professors and friends and 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 the like, but certainly, um, so when I talk about you know my career and and what it means to one be a PGA professional, but then to be a PGA master professional, to me I don't take it lightly, um, and it was actually a part of my plan. So I didn't just stumble on this. You know, I didn't go into the industry just thinking I was going to come in and be mediocre. I researched it, just like you said, I researched what it was about. And I said, well, what's the top, you know, what's the top rung of the ladder? Um, that's why I'm going in to do this. So that allowed me to focus. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And, and I really want to help every listener here and all other uh, Lincoln alum and students to do that same kind of thing. Um, there's a process by which to do it. And I would love to share it when we're done. I'll talk about how I'm going to share that process with everyone. Thank you. I'm, I'm getting messages right now. So excited to get into the conversation that I didn't. Mm -hmm. I don't think I formally introduced myself for um, for the participants. Mm -hmm. So um, for those that you may or may not know, my name is Day Cox. I'm class of 2008 from university. Um, I am currently one of the co-founders of Enjoy Tech USA, which is an education technology company. Uh, and my brother and I, who's also a Lincoln alumni, we both are 2008. Spoiler alert with twins, uh, for those that weren't there in that era, uh, created a software 
and hardware that students can use inside the classroom as a classroom response system where they could automatically take, take exam, act, answer questions, and the software itself aggregates the data and you get all this in the moment data to improve, debunk, and learn and have been informed, made informed decision around instruction based on the technology that we have. So I was asked to um, conduct this uh, conversation part of, because of part of my entre entrepreneurship background in addition to some other stuff that we do as well. Um, I thought they could afford uh, Jameer or Tribe Q so they, could, they had me in the building. And I just, I, I, I kind of, I was excited about the opportunity just to have this conversation with you, Anthony. Brilliant. It's excellent. So, I mean, you and I had a, a chance to talk uh, yesterday briefly, and it was just a couple of things in, like, your, your, in your <laughs> testimony that kind of like, stood right. out to me. So if you don't mind, if you just tell us a, a, your story. So, so I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I'm a product of a military family. I think um, my family goes back probably six generations, um, you know, military. And literally right after I was born, my dad got stationed in Germany. Um, so we lived in Germany twice, France, Belgium. Um, you know, we traveled a lot in Europe. My dad worked for NATO. So that's kind of relevant, you know, based on what we're dealing with these days. Um, and my mom actually worked for American Express and um, a lot of history there. So, so I grew up, you know, having family steeped in Baltimore. My family goes, is all from Baltimore. Uh, we've done our genealogy. We go back. I've gone back as far as the, the early to mid 1800s. You know, my family is right there in Baltimore. Um, Southwest Baltimore and West Baltimore, to be specific. And while I traveled abroad, I had a very strong family foundation in Baltimore, which still exists to this day. So, so going to Lincoln, um, I went to Lincoln. I had never visited the university. I'd visited all these other schools, Howard, Hampton, so many other schools. And my mom said, you know what? Your, your cousin Peter is there, Pete Dorsey. Um, he was there and my mom said, you need to go to Lincoln. You don't need to go where all your friends are going. They were all going to Howard and Hampton and some stayed home at Morgan. My mom said, you need to be different. You need to go to Lincoln. And I had never visited. It wasn't even on my list. And literally I showed up at Lincoln on that Sunday of freshman week. And I immediately, and I kid you not, I immediately felt at home. Um, some of the upperclassmen were welcoming us, doing registration, and it was just like, you know what, we just jump right in. Um, and certainly while I was at Lincoln, and this, is, this might resonate with some of you, and I'll be brief on this part of the story, but I was a mediocre student in high school, mediocre in college. I played a lot of sports. I mean, you know, basketball, football, lacrosse, um, tennis. I played on a tennis team at Lincoln. And so I was never really strong in academics until one day, I happened to be studying in the library and I went down into the stacks and I stumbled upon these yearbooks and these yearbooks for, were from as far back as Lincoln's founding when it was Ashman Institute. And I kind of thumbed through those yearbooks and I read some of those stories and, and, and I saw these men at the time who, you know, had one bag and they came from everywhere you can imagine. And everything they owned, they had in one bag, and they came and made something of themselves. And at that moment, it, the light bulb went off for me. And we, everybody here listening can probably pinpoint that light bulb moment. But I had that light bulb moment where the voice said to me, how dare you? How dare you be mediocre? How dare you stand on the shoulder, shoulders of these individuals and come here and be mediocre. And it was from that point forward, I decided I was going to hit my books. I was going to be about it. I was going to be a student leader. I was going to be more responsible. Um, I think Mike Hancock is on here. Mike was my RA, so he remembers the old Tony. I was always the, the, the comic and, and, and lively and fun and, you know, good trouble. But, you know, it was about buckling down and hitting those books. And I, I became class president and uh, forge lifelong relationships, 
and that just propelled me to go on to do great things in corporate and, and sports and philanthropy and, and some of those things. So, so it's safe to say like your life at LU prepared you for some of the prof professional evolutions that you encountered. 1000%, 1000%. Uh, I, I you know, some of the things that people look at Lincoln and say, oh, I could never go to a school that's, you know, up here in the, in the sticks. Um, that to me is one of the greatest attributes that Lincoln has. I think, you know, Lincoln being secluded, having that storied history, um, you know, that's what did it for me. I was able to go there and focus and not be distracted by a city environment, an urban environment, family, friends. Um, so, so the curriculum, I think, was strong. The relationships were strong. Uh, we were allowed to be ourselves um, and not have to explain who and what you are and where you come from and, and why you do what you do. You just come as you are and, and you're accepted. So that's what I really loved about Lincoln. Yeah, I think I, one of the, I think like one of the most important thing about Lincoln and just HBCUs in, in general is just it kind of your identity and belonging in society. Absolutely, but well said. Especially, with, especially being in certain spaces where you always have to fight for validation. Yes, um, around other uh, ac uh, academia that that came from the same community environment surrounding mm -hmm. you, it just kind of gives you a little bit more efficacy and empowerment on mm -hmm. being in spaces where you can actually feel that you belong based on uh, mm -hmm. that reinforcement at Lincoln, Lincoln University and mm -hmm. knowing that you have a purpose when you leave Lincoln University as well. Wow, and I, and absolutely. So, so one of the things that you... Uh, you know... No, sorry. go ahead, go ahead. No, well, I'm, I'm, you, you, I think you make such a valid point. I think, you know, for our listeners and some of those who have been out for a few years, you, they can probably attest to this. What Lincoln prepares you to do is to understand that not only do I belong in this greater corporate environment or educational environment, be it grad school or, or whatever that is, not only do I belong here, wait, I can conquer this environment, right? I have the tools that are necessary to get out here and thrive and be a difference maker, right? I don't have to get into this environment and be a, um, to be status quo, you know, and feel small in this environment. I can literally get here and be, be, be a giant. So, you know, I just challenge everybody to learn Lincoln's history and, and just go back and look at all of the greats that graduated from Lincoln who, who've contributed and poured. You know, we carry that with us when we go out into the world. It's a very strong uh, uh, um, resource. And one quick point, inevitably, you're going to go into the majority workplace and folks are not going to hear about Lincoln. They're not going to know what Lincoln University is and they're going to think that it's something that it's not. But you have to stand assured that we have a storied past. We have greats that have come from here. We've got, we have world, uh, global uh, uh, leaders that have come from Lincoln University. So it's not for us to cower in the face of that. It's for us to stand on, on that reputation and, and, and stand strong and confident. Well said. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that we had talked about in your conversation, I think is as a, a young alumni um, and also being considered a millennial, Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you talked about this 10 year plan. Yes. Right. And you being on your third 10 year plan. Mm -hmm. Now, prior to you being on your third 10 year plan, uh, during the 9 11 crisis, where we actually mm -hmm. went into a recession, uh, you decided to pivot. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, as considered my life for myself, I'm a former educator. Uh, I taught mm -hmm. for like about seven years, and I, then I decided to retire from education and kind of like pursue my passion. Right. Can you just talk to us a little bit more around that timeline, where, what you were doing and that motivation for you actually to pivot and how that led to you come up with the, the, the whole 10 year plan ideology? Absolutely. So, you know, when I graduate, well, my, my senior year, that December, um, November, I had recruit, I got recruited by Revlon um, so I had my job lined up well before I graduated. 
And once I graduated, I learned a lot. I went in and I flourished and I did extremely well. And, and some of our listeners may be able to relate to this. No matter how well I did, um, it wasn't good enough, right? My numbers were above all of my, my cohorts who had gone to majority universities. I didn't cheat like they cheated. Well, yeah, they cheated. Um, but I didn't cheat. You know, I used the power of relationships with my, my accounts to get the successes that I got. Um, when, you know, I realized that, okay, you know, it was a big boy moment. Like they, they recruited me, but they weren't committed to retaining, right? It was, it's two different things. You know, you can have a company recruit you, but are they really intent on, uh, retaining you and, and developing and growing you. So those were the things I kind of took notice. And then when the time was right for me, I decided, you know what, I'm not, I'm leaving. I'm going to go out on my own terms. Um, I left the corporate and I left Revlon and I decided to move back to Baltimore. Um, and when I went back to Baltimore, I started working in human services and I really felt like, you know, let, you know, go back on your, this is, early 90s, right? And and the crack epidemic was hitting and, and things were just really, you know, thrown. You know, if you go to Baltimore, any city, you know that things were just off. So I figured, you know what, let me support and, and mentor young men, um, young, young women. Uh, and I started working in human services. I then worked for the uh, Baltimore Urban League, um, left there. I, that's where I got my Kellogg Fellowship. I started that. And then I went over and started doing policy work for the state of Maryland Department of Human Resources. I was in policy research, uh, research and systems, um, did a lot of policy uh, work there for the state of Maryland. So it comes to your point where you said, you know, 9-11 hit. And I'll never forget anybody who was on this call who's old enough to remember where you were when 9-11 hit. Um, that particular day, I decided I'm, I, something just told me. I'll never forget. I was watching the Today Show. And uh, they had a special on Howard Hughes and it just kind of struck my attention. So I sat down in my chair and I said, you know, what? let me sit and watch this. I'll go to work, you know, a little bit later. And I started watching this thing on Howard Hughes. And then the story came on. You, you see the, the planes going into the World Trade Center. And that was just traumatic. Right. And anybody who was around during that time is old enough to remember it was a very strange and eerie time very much like what we're experiencing today. And after things began to settle down, it was, it was uh, Mar Martin Luther King's birthday weekend. I used to take a group of guys to a uh, golf getaway. We came here to Florida. We went to Palm Coast, and we would just do Martin Luther King's birthday weekend, and we would call it uh, Living the Dream. And we would do some reflective work. We play golf a lot, eat, you know, drink, have a good time. But we would always ask ourselves, are we living this dream, right? Are we living Dr. King's dream? And it was great fellowship. And, and after 9-11, we decided, are we going to take this trip? And emphatically, we all said, yes, we are. We're going to go and do it. And I was here in Florida on that trip. And that's when, you know, I, I asked myself that question Am I living my passion? And at that moment, long story short, I decided, you know what? I've done that. I've worked in policy. I've worked in government. I've worked in corporate. I need to do something that I'm really passionate about. And at that moment, I decided I was going to come back, develop my plan, and pursue my, my passion, which was, you know, helping people on a whole different level. And I came to Florida, came to the Golf Academy. Of course, I had a plan. I wasn't going to just come here and try to figure it out, but I, I developed that plan and figured out, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to pursue that because I knew that golf as an industry, we're the, we're the largest working sports organization in the world. Our revenue, the money that we manage or, or, or oversee or generate is larger than all other spectator sports combined. So for you basketball fans, football fans, baseball, soccer, you combine all of those spectator sports, bring them together. They don't touch what we do. We do well over $300 billion a year. Um, um, we do, I mean, is it, golf is just ridiculous in terms of revenue. And But what I saw, and it took some foresight, but 
I saw that golf did not have people that were representative of me. So around that time, that's when Tiger Woods came on the scene, but that was it, right? And then knowing history, Lincoln teaches you to learn history, knowing the history of golf, I realized that there were fewer people playing golf at that time than it was 20, 30,